My name is Roy Clarkson. I've been with Spring for about six years. A uh, little bit of trivia. Craig and I joined Spring back at VMware within two weeks of each other. And we've worked on the same team that whole entire time. Actually, Not different teams, but the same different teams. Yeah. I didn't follow that. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's been uh, a really fun experience, and Craig and I have had uh, a lot of fun working on different projects within Spring. Um, let's see. Right now, we are currently working on a project called Spring Cloud Services, and that is deployed on PCF, and that's what we're here to talk about today, and how to build cloud-native Java applications that you deploy to that Spring Cloud Services. And I'm... As the slide hints, I'm Craig Walls. I've been working with Roy for a long time now uh, for a variety of things, Spring Cloud Services. Um, you also may recognize, the, you know, I wrote Spring in Action, Spring Boot in Action, things like that. And I, I tweet random crap all the time. So that's, that's my role. Now, I got a question for you guys. How many of you went to Josh Long's Spring uh, Cloud Native Java talk yesterday? See, I didn't go. Uh, I hear good things, mostly from Josh. But um, <laughs> I, I hear it's a good talk. I hear it was packed full of great information and that when I watch the video, I might have to watch it in slow mode just to keep up with it. Yeah, I, I asked him to give me a review of everything he covered and he just kind of sighed. And so then he spent 10 minutes and was like, how just, did you cover all of that Just in the stuff? review. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're not gonna cover everything that he covered, uh, some smaller bits and pieces of it, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow everything since we're uh, gonna be uh, showing some of it again. All right, so what does this equation mean to you? We've got Spring Cloud, we've got Netflix OSS, and all of that on top of Pivotal Cloud Foundry. If you were to answer that question, what is that? Well, it's happy developers, obviously. <laughs> and How more happy, Roy? They're very happy. They are going to start talking about rainbows and unicorns because they're so happy that it's easy to deploy their applications to a stable, productive platform. Uh, what, what does it really mean? It's, this is, uh, uh, I will, I'm gonna take one little sidetrack here. Maybe you noticed in the keynote yesterday, they changed the lights. They had sea green lights, that was all the pivotal stuff, and then they changed to green, that was all the spring stuff. Well, this logo is sea green, so that's for PCF, <laughs> pivotal. And you'll notice back here on this guy, the OSS version of Spring Cloud is the regular Spring Green. So that's how you can differentiate. And uh, yeah, not to mention that it's got that CF thing at the bottom, which is, stands for Cloud Foundry, of course. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and jump into a demo of some of the open source cloud, uh, Spring Cloud libraries. Do you have anything in common about that? Nope. I'm eager to see this, Roy. You're eager to see it. I think you've seen it several times already. So everybody, please just shout if you can't see something. Um, try to make fonts nice and big. So I've got this app that uh, basically just inc increments numbers, but it's gonna showcase config server, Eureka, uh, Hystrix dashboard, and show how all of those pieces fit together. And this is gonna be a config, sir, uh, a config first approach to how to deploy an architecture. So the first thing I need to do is go in here to my config server, and I'm gonna start that guy. And he's starting up. So I'm gonna switch over to my editor and show you that config server is gonna serve up this bit of configuration, my default number in my application is gonna be 42. And we've got this other little bit of information here, Eureka Client Service URL Default Zone. And what does that do? Well, that is the config server is going to give that information to all of the client applications that get external configuration from the config server so that they all know where the Eureka uh, <coughs> service registry is. Okay. So we've got a config server running. And what's the next thing we can do? Oops. We've got a Eureka server. So we'll go in here and start this guy. And 
Okay. And as you can see, all these things are Spring Boot applications. There's not really anything uh, different or special about them. They'd, but we are starting up different Spring Boot applications for each of these. And because these are running on localhost, they're, they're going to have different port numbers. Uh, 8888 for the config server, 8761 for Eureka. Uh, partly because we're running on localhost just to keep from having any port collisions, but also um, just so happens that those are the default uh, ports that the clients of these services are going to look for if you don't tell them otherwise. So it makes it a little bit more convenient. Yeah, and I, I'm going to show you the code and the configuration a little bit after we finish running through the demo. And I'll, some of these are default, default ports, so we aren't specifying them. And some of them we are specifying because you have to, otherwise you'll have the port collision like Craig described. Okay, so we have a config server running. We have a Eureka server running. Uh, what else do we need? We need some application. That's what we need. So let's start... Um, our numbers service. So this is going to be a, what you can call a microservice. It's got a RESTful endpoint that serves up a number when you make a request to the slash number endpoint. And all it does is just increment that number and give you the next one. Now, number service is configured to use the external configuration, and that means that it's also configured to uh, register itself with Eureka. So I switched back over to the Eureka tab, and you can see down there at the bottom, registered instance number service. So our number service is now registered with Eureka. That means it's discoverable from other services that uh, can consume the, uh, the Eureka registry. Okay, so now that we have a number service running, let's see, what else do we have? We've got a numbers app, so let's, that's going to have our UI for our application and the entry point where we make our request for the number. Once again, another Spring Boot application. So now we have four different Spring Boot applications running, all doing different concerns. Our numbers app is started up on port 8080. Now let's go over to the browser for a minute. And what I'm going to do is open up, well, first of all, I'll show you. If I hit that endpoint, now you can see that I get number one, and if I do it again, I'm going to get number two, and so on and so forth. But if I go to the Spring Boot actuator endpoint, and the Spring Boot actuator is this nice little dependency that you can add in. They've, we've talked about it in, uh, a little bit in the keynote, and then I'm sure Josh covered some of that in his presentation as well. Uh, but it gives you a lot of very useful endpoints. Uh, one of those is the ENV. And you can see up here at the top that config service is the config server is configured to point to a file on my local machine. And inside that file, you can see the values that I already showed you before. They're getting populated within the uh, environment of this application. So we've got the default number, which is 42, and then the Eureka instance, uh, the location is also in there. And if we go back over to the, the Eureka instance, you can see down at the bottom, uh, the numbers app is also registered. So now we have both a numbers app, the front end UI, and we have the back end microservice, numbers service. And if we go take a look at the Eureka dashboard, that just confirms what we were already seeing in the logs. You could see that we've got Numbers and number service, right there. And these little parentheses with the number one, that means we've got one instance of each of those running. And then it gives you a link to, to those as well. And this one looks a little different, though. You can see that numbers has got a very basic 
name, whereas the number service has this uh, crazy thing that's added on to the end of that. Well, it turns out if you want to be able to run multiple instances of a service, you need to add some sort of differentiator, random value to the end of the name of that service so that they don't collide with each other. Because if you try to register with the same name in Eureka, then it's going to either conflict or deregister the previous one, or it just, uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> so you have to have different names for the different uh, instances running of the uh, services if you want to have multiple versions or multiple instances of it. And I can show you how that works. And just uh, go back to the number service again, and we could start up another, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, we're starting up a second instance of the number service. And now if we go back to this Eureka dashboard, we've got two of them. And they've got, both have a unique identifier tacked on to the end of their name so that they have unique names. And now we have two different ones. Now, what's interesting about that? Uh, let's take a look at uh, If I typed everything correctly, there you go. Now we're, we're hitting our front end numbers app, and you can see that it's making requests to the number service, the back end microservice. But you can also see up here at the top that it's flipping back and forth between those two different instances of the backing uh, number service instance. Yeah, each of them has their own state of what number they're on, obviously. So when you switch back and forth, you're going to see different. You're going to see, you're not going to see one, two, three, four. You're going to see jumping back and forth between those numbers. Yep. So the numbers are getting kind of similar there, but if we uh, go and stop one of them and then restart it, because this is only working, it's only doing it in memory. So you can see that right now, uh, ribbon underneath, ribbon is the uh, library that's underneath that helps to do client side load balancing. It's going to take all of the, the look at the information provided by Eureka, whether if you've got multiple service instances running, and it's going to do, by default, a round robin and just go from one, each one, back and forth. And that's how it does load balancing with between the two different service instances. Um, let's see. Yep, and there you go. So you can see the other one has come back up, and you see it's restarted at number one. And the second instance is still running, so it's still incrementing uh, the, the number higher and higher. So you can see that it's going back and forth between those two different service instances. Anything you want to add to that? Yep. All right. So what else is interesting about this? Uh, we can also run a Hystrix dashboard. Again, it's just another Spring Boot application. Open up another tab, see this guy. Who here knew Hystrix was the like genus or whatever of porcupine? <laughs> Seriously, it is. That is why that funny looking animal is on the Hystrix dashboard. All right, so we've got this green bubble, and it's sitting over there, and you can see that it's getting all these requests and all this uh, data is coming in to Hystrix. Green is good. So, all right, what happens when our services go away? Well, let's stop one of them. And because we still have one of the other ones running, it's gonna stay green and Ribbon, in conjunction with Eureka, are gonna to continue to hit the one that's still available. 
you can see you got one negative hit in there, that little red. No. Nope, it went away, sorry. We had one failure, so it, it, it got one failure, but largely it's realized that it needed to switch over to the, the working service instance. Uh, but what happens if you get rid of both of them? Um, hopefully I'm not gonna stop the wrong one. Okay, so what happens when you get a thousand tabs open? It's hard to remember where you are. Oh, there we go. So everything's failing because we don't have any backing service instance is running for the number service, and so we're getting total failure now from that request to the, the service instance. But because we've got those protected with a circuit breaker, what's happening? Well, we're getting our default number back. So 42 is being returned instead of the number coming from the number service. And so in this way, you're, the users of your application can see a default value. The front end application doesn't fall over on its face and everything appears to continue to work normally. Your ops guys and your dev guys or your dev ops guys are now working to try and figure out what's wrong with your service and they're gonna get it back and working. And then the users may not be any wiser. And we can see, uh, let's see, let's go and start one of these back. Unfortunately, it usually takes a moment or two before you start seeing it. Yeah. It takes a while before it gets started up and a, to a little while before it registers with the Eureka and a little while before the client sees that. That's right. So the number service has been re-registered with Eureka. And if we come back over and watch this guy shortly, I thought I'd configured this to be a little bit more aggressive, but at some point we will see. <laughs> At some point. It always takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take. Especially when the presentation. Oh, come on, come on. There it goes. Okay. So you can see that it's it between Hystrix and the circuit breaker functionality, it finally had realized that the service is back available and it started pulling that service instead of returning the default value. And so everything's back working again. Uh, what, what do you mean configurable? <laughs> it, it is. There's a default value, and I forget exactly what it is. Um, I, I've set it lower, but it, it wasn't super low. Um, so generally speaking, you don't want to have it be too aggressive because you don't want it what it's doing is it's going to keep trying the service behind the scenes and you want that value to be high enough where you're not creating tons of network chatter while the service is either coming back up or not available. So it's, it's got an algorithm where it sort of exponentially will increase that timeout. Uh, it'll try it and it'll try it again shortly after that and then it'll kind of extend that time period if it still keeps not being available. So does that make sense? Uh, but it is, there is uh, some configuration that you can do to control how quickly that it does that. Um, all right, yes sir. Can we set up auto scaling for Eureka discovery or just the discovery server? Uh, like if, if the server uh, is not scaling and you want to scale it, can you just bring up another one? Uh, auto scaling of which the piece? You had two microphones, two instances of one microphones. Yep. One of them went down, so all the scaling just uh, shoot another one up. I guess spin up the, the, the same minimum two uh, instance for each server. Is uh, there any configuration for that? Well, this, this being running on localhost, the answer is not really. But I mean, you, right. we could certainly manually start up a, mul a couple extra Eureka uh, instances if we wanted to. Um, uh, to kind of answer your question whether you can have Eureka have multiple instances that really leads into cloud uh, discussion of this running in Cloud Foundry, which leads into where we're headed with Spring Cloud Services. Okay. Um, all of the code for this is very uh, simple, and generally speaking, things involve adding. 
an annotation. So in this case, enable config server. That's all the annotation you need. This is the extent of the application. It's a very basic Spring Boot application. And you've got some resources for the config server. And in this case, you're telling it where your Git URL is. And we've got it at a local file server. And setting the port to 8888. But you're, you're probably in a real app want to have this pointing at, you know, some other Git server either inside your firewall or even GitHub or, you know, anything that implements the, uh, right. the Git uh, protocol. We're, we're using the local host just to try to avoid the network, but uh, in a real environment you would have this running on a, a legitimate Git server and not trying to hit the local host. So, very good point, Craig. Um, to run a Eureka server, it's, it's really the same thing. You've got... Enable Eureka server, that annotation. And then in the resources, there's a little bit of configuration that you have to do. In this case, to, to set the default zone, uh, since we're running things on local host, and we're setting the port there again. Um, Spring Cloud provides starters. So we've got Spring Cloud, Starter, Eureka Server. So it's that combination of those three things. You're adding a starter to a Spring Boot app. You are adding the annotation and then adding a minimal set of configuration for the environment where you want to run the app. And then otherwise, is as vanilla of a Spring Boot app as you can get. Yep. Is there a way to rate limit? Rate limit. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So not with one. What? Um, you know. I, I I don't know the answer to that. Whether you can rate limit on Eureka, um, but I'm not terribly concerned about it either, because as far as a Eureka client is concerned, the only time they should be frequently beating up on Eureka is when they're constantly just giving the heartbeat back to Eureka. So you don't want to rate limit that, otherwise instances will go down. And as far as consuming Eureka data as a client of Eureka, that stuff gets cached. And so you're, you're only going to go out every so often and get that. Normally you're going to work with your local cache of, the, of whatever Eureka told you the previous time. And so um, short, short answer, whether you can rate limit Eureka, I don't know. Um, probably there's a, a way to do it, I don't know. But I'm not sure why you would need to. So just to review, we started up. Uh, five different apps, uh, actually six, because we had two different instances of the service instance running. So we had a Eureka server, we had a config server, and a history dashboard. Those are Spring Cloud Netflix, Spring Cloud Config, and Spring Cloud uh, Netflix again. And then we had an app service and an app UI running. And all of those were running as separate Spring Boot applications, registering your, with your Eureka server, and getting external configuration from the config server. So. Switching gears a little bit, <clears throat> you had to do all this, what Roy called kung fu on that last slide. You had to do all these, this setup. You had to go set up a config server. You had to go set up a, a Eureka server. You had to go set up the Hystrix dashboard. And you had to run those as individual Spring applications. And then that's before you even got to the point where you're writing the incredibly complex business logic of generating numbers. And so you had to stand up all these things first. And this is a simple application, and we haven't even started even talking about things like security and how you're going to secure those, uh, secure the config server, how you're going to secure um, the communication between your, your clients of Eureka and Eureka itself. We haven't even got there yet. And certainly you could do those things. You could use Spring Security to do that, and you could configure and security however you thought was appropriate. But you have to do it yourself. It's, it's You have to kind of bake that in yourself. Good news is you get to... You get to tinker around with Spring Security and get to learn a lot and maybe get to enjoy that exercise. But the reality of it is it's, it's you have to bake that in yourself. And then running this on localhost and, and all, there's a certain amount of reliability concern. If you're running it on your own servers, you have to worry, you have to, you're in charge of managing the reliability. Uh, certainly if you run it into a cloud environment like Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, reliability is um, kind of baked into the platform. But still, when you're standing up each individual uh, Eureka config server, if you want to have multiple Eurekas, you want to deal with that, that becomes your problem. And so that's where Pivotal, uh, I'm sorry, where Spring Cloud Services 
comes in. And so uh, we, we've basically taken the open source Spring Cloud projects, specifically, not all of them, but specifically Cloud, uh, Spring Cloud Config Server, and then Spring Cloud Netflix, Service Registry, and Hystrix Dashboard. And we've wrapped them up as services that you can get out of the Spring, oh, I'm sorry, out of the Cloud Foundry marketplace. You can, just like you would get a database service, just like you would get a Rabbit service or a Redis service, you would go to the marketplace, pick one of these as a service, bind your applications to it, and now you're, you're not having to deal with standing up each individual um, Hystrix dashboard or service registry as an application. They're services that you can bind to. So again, kind of, kind of rehash this. If you were building your own Spring Cloud server, whether it would be the Hystrix dashboard, service registry, config server, it doesn't matter, you're going to have to go through all these steps on the left side of the screen here. As opposed to if you're using Spring Cloud Services, you say CF create service. You, you, it's a little bit more to it than this. You specify the service name and things like that. But uh, once you've done that, now you have a service. And rather than in your configuration for your individual applications, configuring the locations of those services, you simply create your app and bind it using a CF bind service. You bind to those services you picked up from the marketplace. And so all the other stuff that, that you would normally have to do if you were building this from open source Spring Cloud, we've dealt with that for you in Spring Cloud Services. So when it comes to the security, that's the one thing a lot of people like to ask about. How do I secure my Eureka? How do I secure my config server? And it, and it comes down to this. Um, services, they're all secured with OAuth 2, uh, using Spring Security, Spring Security OAuth 2. And the credentials are exposed via the service bindings. I'm going to show you this a little bit later in a demo. I'm going to show you where the service bindings are and how, what those look like and how you can, if you were acting as the client, how you could use those to even look up the tokens and use them yourself. Um, reliability, that's dealt with by the platform. Um, high, again, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, highly reliable platform, um, has health management baked into it. It's just part of the deal. Um, and so you can feel confident that now you have these services um, from whether it be a service registry, config server, or whatever. These are running on a platform as a service. You can bind to your application. And you can feel confident that you have a highly reliable platform and the security between your application and these services is dealt with for you. You just have to focus on writing your business applications to, as, as individual microservices to use these. So how does this work, Roy? Okay, let's talk a minute about service brokers. And here's a service broker API, and this is what we use to build Spring Cloud services. We have a Spring Cloud services service broker, and what it does is it allows you to communicate with Cloud Foundry to provision and do all these different, uh, basically, CRUD operations against different services that uh, are provisioned through the service broker. And the reason you need a service broker is, for example, you might want to do some additional logic and provision additional services that you might need, for example, an AMQP service to run with your application. And the result is something like this. If you've used PCF before, you get this nice screen for the marketplace where you can just go and click these different services and add them very easily to your uh, org and space within PCF. And then you can, like Craig mentioned a minute ago, you can bind them to your application. Optionally, you could, if you're more uh, attuned to using the, uh, the, the CLI, you can also do like CF Marketplace. Essentially see a command line version of this, this screen right here, and then from there use CF Bind Service to do your bindings. So the three uh, Spring Cloud Services services are the ones that are the Circuit Breaker, the Service Registry, and the Config Server, the ones sort of down at the bottom right. The RabbitMQ and the MySQL are things that we use within our service, uh, Spring Cloud services. So those are uh, requirements on our side. Uh, but that's the, a picture of what you would need to, to run Spring Cloud services. And a little bit more specifically, we have a broker app and a worker app. And we ha have provision of RabbitMQ in between them. And so we uh, do a lot of management in terms of uh, provisioning these services. And whenever we do an update and, and create for them, uh, we do some different work behind the scenes to get those all set up and prepared for you. And so it, you can make as many of these requests as you need to, and they get queued up, and 
everything will work really well. And the good news is, this is really just under the cover stuff. As an actual user of Spring Cloud Services, this is just extra information. It's just telling you kind of how we, how we made the hot dog. Yeah, this uh, as a developer, this wouldn't be really any big concerns. But like Craig said, it's it's uh, often useful to know what's going on underneath the covers, and this this helps sort of clear that up. And just uh, a little bit more information: we we use Spring Boot, Spring Cloud Netflix, Config Server, uh, the Spring Cloud connectors, Spring Security, Spring Data, Spring AMQP. We use all these projects to build Spring Cloud services. So. We find them very reliable. These are all open source projects. We highly recommend using all the Spring projects. Uh, we are big fans, obviously. <laughs> all right. So just kind of go over what these services do again. I mean, Roy showed in a demo form of the open source stuff. But, um, just kind of a rehash of that uh, in the context of Spring Cloud Services. We have a config server. Uh, it, it's a service, uh, obviously, we, we offer in the marketplace. And it's going to deploy via the, the service broker, it's going to deploy an instance of the Spring Cloud Config Server. And it's going to have a Git backend. And so you're going to have your configuration, an application.yaml or some application name.yaml or some properties file, whatever, however you decide to, to do that. Basically, all the same mechanisms that are available to a Spring Boot app that you might normally put under source main resources, you're going to be able to put that into a Git repository. And the good news about putting it into a Git repository is now you have tra track, you can track the uh, history of this thing. You can roll back if you want to. You can uh, see who committed it if you, you know, want to you know, yell at somebody. I don't know. Uh, or want to maybe pat them on the back for writing really good configuration. I don't know. But you at least know who did it. You can, um, you have a history of all this stuff. All the same reasons you would want to put code in a source code repository, it's also good to put your configuration in a source code repository as opposed to just having it floating around on the file system where you have none of this stuff. And so with it being in GitHub, the Spring Cloud Config Server is going to pick it up from there, uh, possibly from the root, possibly from various search paths under that. Um, and it's going to pick that up from Git, serve it to whatever applications are bound to the Config Server. Uh, security, again, goes back to the OAuth stuff. Only those applications that are bound to the config server are going to be able to actually use the config server. And by bound, I mean they have access to the binding details, the information necessary to pick up an OAuth 2 access token. Um, and there's really not much to it from the client perspective. When the client starts, um, it's going to basically treat the config server as another property source, basically a Spring 3.1. If you go back that far in the Spring history, Spring 3.1 introduced this idea of the environment abstraction. With that are various property sources, some of which Spring, I mean, Spring Boot makes great use of this. You see, this is how it knows to go look at application.properties because there's a property source to tell it to look there. Well, this is a, it's going to add another property source that's going to tell it to go look, among other places, go look in the config server, uh, the config server it's bound to. And it, from there, it's going to pick up its properties from there. Any of the properties that uh, you might have configured, it's going to be available just like it would if they were in environment variables or in application.properties. So essentially, it looks a little like this. You have your source code, I'm sorry, your config uh, properties over in Git, things like you know, some key, some secret, whatever, whatever the properties are. I just made up stuff when I made this slide. So some properties that you, st you shove over there. Maybe they're an application YAML file. Maybe they're in a property, whatever the name of the application name is, dot properties file. It doesn't matter. They're going to be over there in Git. And the config server is going to pick them up, and it's going to distribute them out to all the applications who are bound to the service. It just <coughs> Just as simple as that. The dependencies you're going to need for this, it's worth noting. Um, if you're using OSS Spring Cloud, you just need the uh, Spring Cloud config client. But it, for Spring Cloud services, we have a different starter that we, we encourage you to use, the Spring Cloud services starter config client. And the reason for that is we just have a few extra dependencies that help the client deal with the, the various issues that we solve, such as security, for example. And so those parts are kind of baked in. Those, those dependencies you need for that to work are baked into our starter. If you try to use the OSS starter, you're, it's just not going to work because you're going to be missing a few dependencies. From a service registry point of view, again, it's just Eureka. Um, it's it's going to work the same way that open source Eureka does. But instead of standing this ser server up yourself, you're going to get it from the marketplace. You're going to bind your applications to it. and Again, the same way it works with config server, you're going to have some binding details. And 
Again, I'm going to show you this a little bit later in a demo. You're going to get these binding details. The client is going to, the client of Eureka is going to get these to, to look up a access token, and from there, it's going to be able to talk to Eureka, register itself with Eureka, send the heartbeat to Eureka, look up other services that it may want to consume from Eureka, and it's going to be able to do that because it has the token. Nobody else is going to be able to do that. Okay? And uh, again, the starter automatically configures a discovery client that's dealt with for you. Um, it's just going to work. Kind of looks like this. I love showing this slide. It's one of my favorite slides because I'm going to show you this example later called Fortune Teller. And the way Fortune Teller works is we have a service and we have a UI. And the, serv the UI is going to actually consume the service. And so we start off, when we start up the uh, Fortune Teller service, it's going to introduce itself to the service registry and say, hey, my name is Fortune Teller Service. Actually, I think the actual name we go with now is just simply Fortunes. But regardless, it's going to say, here's, here's what my name is, Fortunes. And it's going, to, it's going to now be registered. And every so often, it's going to send a heartbeat to the service registry to basically say, I'm still here. And Fortune Teller UI is going to come along and say, hey, tell me what you know about this Fortune Teller service. And it's going to send back, obviously, a whole bunch of XML. You don't have to worry about that. You never have to deal with that yourself because the client side of uh, the discovery client piece is going to know how to deal with that. And it's going to, along with Ribbon, choose an instance of Fortune Teller service. If there's only one, that's pretty easy. But if there's multiple, it's going to pick an instance. And then it's going to be able to make that call, say, hey, give me a random fortune. And the app's working. Now the UI is actually using the other service, thanks to Eureka helping it find it. It's essentially, you can think of it as like a phone book uh, for, for microservices. Anybody remember what phone books are? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Anyone younger in the audience, I apologize. Uh, ask, ask somebody next to you. OK. Again, we have a, another distinct starter for Spring Cloud Services for the same reasons we had it for Config Server, just because we have some additional dependencies that are required. Circuit Breaker Dashboard, still same kind of thing. You're going to configure this, or I'm sorry, you're going to pick it up from the marketplace, you're going to create a service, and you're going to bind it. Now, the way it's going to work, though, is it's a little bit more interesting because we do have to deploy the Hystrix dashboard itself, but because Hystrix really only looks at an individual stream at a time, we need to actually use Turbine, another Netflix project that basically aggregates streams into a single stream. So you're going to have multiple services, multiple instances of services, all with various circuit breaker metrics coming in. Turbine's going to aggregate those into a single stream for the dashboard to, to work with. And on top of that, it's not the normal HTTP stream that you might be familiar with if you've worked with Turbine before. It's, a, it's going to be sending that stream over Rabbit. And so we also deploy, a, uh, with this, a Rabbit MQ service instance. And again, the starter automatically starts this up, starts up the uh, Turbine client, and away we go. We're going to be, uh, the, the service, the, sorry, the Hystrix dashboard is going to be able to consume this stream over Rabbit. When you go into the dashboard, you're going to see basically what you saw in Roy's open source demo. And it looks a little something like this. We've got some metrics as people are poking at the app, and things are working beautifully, great. Maybe things are broken, whatever. Um, these metrics about the circuit breaker are going to be sent across over Rabbit to the uh, aggregator into the dashboard. And at some point, you're going to see either a failure message or a success message. I jumped ahead myself there. We'll let that go ahead and go. It's going to show you either, hey, the circuit breaker is healthy, it's doing great, it's green, or possibly maybe something's broken and it's, un it's unhealthy. We need to fix that. And once again, just kind of beat a dead horse, you're going to have a, a special starter for this for all the same reasons we had it for config server and the service registry. Now, it is worth mentioning, if, you know, because the Hystrix dashboard is using Rabbit to do this communication, and it's entirely possible that your applications are also using Rabbit, uh, you're going to have a problem. Uh, you're going to have a, a potential conflict here. So essentially what these slides talk about is what you're going to need to do to, if you have your own Rabbit, your own, uh, your own Rabbit connection factory, how you're going to set up a bean. So, uh, we're going to set up a, in the first slide here, help me with this a little bit because it's been a while since I've actually done this. It's just almost a cut and paste effort for me now. Uh, we're going to set up the Hystrix Connection Factory and we're going to uh, designate that with the annotation Hystrix Connection Factory. But elsewhere where we also have another rabbit, we're going to create another rabbit connection factory and we're going to annotate that with primary, meaning 
when you're auto wiring a connection, a rabbit connection factory wherever your application needs one, you're going to get this one. You're not going to get the Hystrix one. You're going to get uh, the one that you configured for your application. So uh, tell me, Roy, what's new in Spring uh, Cloud Services 1.1? So if you guys paying attention to the history, uh, last year at Spring 1, we, Angel was released of Spring Cloud, which was the, the first release. Uh, Spring Boot 1.2 was out. And then shortly after that, we had Spring Cloud Services 1.0. And that was based on Angel and Spring Boot uh, 1.2. Well, over the last year, uh, Spring Cloud Brixton has come out. Spring Boot 1.3 it was made available. And Spring Cloud Services 1.1 is now built on top of Spring Cloud Brixton and Spring Boot 1.3. It's a mouthful. Um, but you're not limited to this. Uh, Boot 1.4 was just made available, uh, GA. So we've done a lot of testing, and, and client apps work with Boot 1.4. So there's, there is uh, forward compatibility there. Um, let's see, we've got asynchronous service provisioning and zero downtime upgrades and updates that are now available in 1.1. We also support highly available topologies for config server and service registry, and then also enhancements to the config server backend. And just a little bit more details about this. One of the changes in Brixton was that uh, from Angel, Angel did give you a, 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 automatically give you a bean that you could use, a REST template bean that you could use within your client application. And Brixton changed that, so now you have to create that bean yourself and also annotate that with load balance so that it uh, wires up the ribbon underpinnings so that it can do the client-side load balancing for you. And then you can adjust, inject that into your uh, controller or, or wherever else in your application you want with an auto-wired uh, REST template. So that's really one of the, the big change from a SCS perspective for Spring, Brixton, uh, Spring Cloud Brixton and Spring Boot. Uh, okay, so we've got zero downtime upgrades and updates. Um, what that means is well, you can update now to a new version of the service broker, or, uh, the Spring Cloud Services service broker, and it's not going to update all of your service instances because those are required by your applications for running, and you don't want us to just do that automatically for you because that might mess up some of your productivity uh, in your production environment. So separately, we provide the ability to upgrade those service instances, and either the space uh, owner or admin can do those, or the developer who's given, been given access within the Oregon space. And, and additionally, the admin can also do that in mass and upgrade all of the service instances for a, spring, a new version of a Spring Cloud Services. So this applies to 1.1, but it's also going to apply to future releases as well as when, when those come out. Um, and this is the service instance dashboard that's now in Spring Cloud Services. We've got upgrade buttons both on individual services and then also the button at the very top there, upgrade service instances, is going to upgrade all of them for you. Um, and you can see right here on the left-hand side, these are, this is all showing a, a report for all of the service instances and all of uh, the orgs that we had set up, and there's three different orgs. Uh, it's a little unfortunate that all the spaces were named the same for the orgs, but those are actually three different development spaces within those three different orgs. So this really gives you this nice holistic view of all of your service instances that you have provisioned for Spring Cloud Services. Uh, highly available topologies. Okay, so config servers, we just use the, uh, the CF API for this and we simply scale out horizontally. If you need additional config servers, you can add those. You can go from one, you can have five if you need them. Uh, it's just totally up to you now, but we now provide that functionality in 1.1. One, one. Uh, service registries have some state, so what that means is that SCS has to do a little bit of work to uh, set up new instances of, of Eureka and make sure that they are aware of each other and can communicate with each other and that their registries are replicated across those. And let's see, changes to HA configurations are also executed so that no application instances experience downtime. That's what I mentioned a minute ago. Um, we're, we're not going to affect your downtime. That was a major high, high priority uh, piece of functionality that we needed to make sure work. Because if we blow up your application when we're doing an upgrade, that's not going to help anybody. <laughs> Uh, okay, so config server enhancements. Now we allow self-signed SSL certificates for HTTPS. 
Um, we support all of the new things from Brixton and Git backends. They've got a lot of new stuff for pattern matching and placeholders. Uh, we also support proxy servers over HTTP or HTTPS. And in addition, we've got uh, Git and SSH protocol support built in too. So all of this is new in SCS 1.1, which uh, came out in June. And with that, I'm gonna let Craig do a demo. So this is kind of, this, this part of the talk is gonna basically mirror what Roy did at the beginning. The difference being, instead of standing up those instances ourselves, I'm going to use uh, Spring Cloud Services, and we're gonna do this. We've, I, the, the demos, because I was a little concerned about hotel network, and supposedly there's a, some sort of security con conference going on here in the city that scared me a little bit, and just for timing's sake, uh, because some of these, there's certain bits of when I walk through this, if I were to walk through this in front of you live, are just going to be, hey, what do you want to talk about while we wait on this to, to, to work out? Uh, I, I, these are all pre-recorded demos. I, I spent a lot of time, multiple times, recording these until I got them to where I felt good about them. So these are pre-recorded demos, so I'm going to basically not even try to lie to you and pretend that I'm typing this stuff. Um, just watch the demos and I'll, I'll walk you through as, the, as they, they flow by and tell you what's going on here. So we're going to start off uh, by just describing what it is that we're, we're deploying. We're deploying um, this, this application called uh, Fortune Teller. And Fortune Teller has essentially two service, what, services. One of them, or two applications, one of them is a service that picks from a database a whole, from a whole bunch of, of fortunes, like you might get in the fortune cookie or something like that. It randomly picks one. And it, it, has a random endpoint and it just gives you one of those fortunes from its pool of fortunes. The uh, Fortune UI, uh, similarly simple, it consumes that service and it's gonna do that by going to Eureka. And it's gonna go to the config server, or perhaps if you're doing the open source version of this, it's gonna go to config server to find out where Eureka is, but we're not doing that. Instead, we're gonna go to Eureka that we're bound to and we're gonna ask Eureka, um, where is the Fortune service? And from the Fortune service, we'll turn around and we'll go ask uh, it give me a random fortune, and this is how it's going to work. Now, to do that, we had to add some dependencies. So this is kind of repeating what I, I spoke about earlier. Uh, to start with, you're going to want to make sure you have these, th this set of stuff in your dependency management. Obviously, if you're using Gradle, um, you have, you're going to put a, you know, the Gradle equivalent of this in there. Uh, we're basically saying we're using Spring Cloud service, Services dependencies is what the first uh, dependency management block says. Um, and the second block is saying we're using Spring Cloud Brixton. The open source side of that is, is Brixton. Uh, it, if you guys are familiar with the build of materials for Spring Boot, uh, this builds on that same concept. Spring Cloud has its own build of materials, and that's the Spring Cloud dependencies, and then we also have a, a bomb that we use for Spring Cloud services as well. Right. So that's what those two are. And then once you have had those in there, um, this is actually just a chunk taken from the, uh, the UI bit, the UI application. So it shows that we have dependencies on the config client uh, starter. We have a dependency on the service registry starter as well as the circuit breaker dashboard starter. Uh, the only real difference between this chunk of POM file for the UI is, as opposed to the service, the fortune service itself, is the fortune service itself didn't have a dependency on circuit breaker. Uh, because we don't have any circuit breakers in that piece of the app. So we just wouldn't have had that dependency. Otherwise, um, pretty much the same set of dependencies. Within the application itself, rather than walk you through all the, the details of the application, it's not dramatically different than what Roy showed you for the numbers app, but just to highlight a few hi um, high, po high points here. Uh, in the, let me make sure I'm looking at the right thing here. In the uh, Fortune service, you automatically get a config server um, client just because you have the config server client starter in your uh, build, but we enable discovery client so that we can be a client of Eureka. In the um, UI, we also, in addition to enable discovery client, we have enable circuit breaker because we're gonna have some circuit breakers that are gonna be publishing a stream so that our dashboard can show them. And you also see here, just by the by, you see that load balanced rest template that later in other areas of our application are using that to consume the Fortune service. Uh, but, you know, this is pretty much the same stuff you would do if you're using OSS. And that's okay. I mean, this is, this, the client side bit of this, you shouldn't really notice the code being dramatically different, if at all, between an OSS, uh, a Spring Cloud OSS application and a Spring Cloud services application. It really comes down to the dependencies I spoke of earlier uh, in the previous slide, 
as well as when you get around to configuring it, there's a lot less configuration. You don't have to tell it where the config server is. Likewise, you don't have to have in the config server telling it where Eureka is because those things are things that you're gonna get from the binding. The binding's gonna tell each one of these applications where those, where those things are. Really, the only thing you need to say, and even then, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you don't have to do this. Um, the only thing you really need to say is spring application name, because this is where your application is going to identify itself. When it goes to the config server, it's going to identify itself as Fortunes or as UI in case there is any application-specific configuration being served from the config, config server. It'll know that, and it'll be able to serve that configuration to these apps. Likewise, for Eureka, it's going to have to identify itself to Eureka so that it knows how to register itself with Eureka. It's going to say, hey, I'm the Fortunes app. The Fortunes service, if anybody needs me, they can look me up by the name Fortunes. Uh, but even then, technically, you don't even have to do this with, with uh, Spring Cloud Services because as, as part of what Spring Cloud Services offers, when you push that application, when you do a CF push, you're going to give it a name, right? And if you don't tell it otherwise with Spring application name, it's just going to use that name. Whatever name you pushed it as, that's the name it's going to assume for Spring application name and it's going to register itself with Eureka. It's going to look up from config server using whatever name you pushed it as. Well, now we're getting to the part where I'm just going to pretend I'm working here. Um, so basically, I start off by just, just showing you that as opposed to looking in the UI, I can do a CF marketplace, and it's going to show me a number of services I can choose from. I probably should have cut out a little bit more uh, time in that because it took a little longer than I'd like, but we have our circuit breaker dashboard. It's got a plan, a single plan called standard. We have our config server. It's also got a single plan of standard. So we're going to need to know these names in a minute when we create services. And we have a service registry of standard. We also have RabbitMQ and MySQL and the autoscaler and all that, that stuff. But um, let's start off by creating a config server. Now the config server, when we create it, it's a little unique. We have to first off identify the service we're interested in, that's B config server. We have to identify the plan and we have to give a name for this instance that we're creating. So I'm just going to call it, oh, I made a mistake there, I'm going to call it config server. That's the name of this, this instance I want to create or this, this service I want to provision. And then we also have to tell it other stuff such as where the uh, get URI is. Where are we going to get our uh, configuration that we want to serve from. And so we have to configure using some, some JSON here, the Git URI, as well as because this particular example has its configuration, not just in the Git URI at the root, but under a directory called configuration, we are also going to need to tell it the search path. And so the search path is simply going to be configuration. Now, there's a whole lot of things we could have configured here. There's a lot of stuff you can configure with regards to the config server. Those are really the only two we needed for this, this particular example. So now we have that. And I could go ahead and look at CF services or CF service config server to see what the status is. But before we do that, let's go ahead and create the uh, service registry. It's a lot simpler. There's not a lot of stuff you have to set up before you do that. So it's really just the name of the service, the plan you want to use, and then the name you want to apply to this, this instance you're provisioning. And then let's go ahead and set up the circuit breaker dashboard. It's, it's the same kind of thing. We're going to need that eventually, so let's go ahead and set it up. Okay. Yes? Yep. Uh, I'm not following. I, I'm sorry. I probably didn't hear that well. So the question is, are the properties that the application depends on staying, they live outside of the application? Uh, and so the answer is yes, that's what config server gives you, is you can pull in external configuration from a remote source like a GitHub or other Git repository. And then all of your applications that use that config server can then pull that information into the, your application. Right, it's the idea that you, you're gonna have a lot of configuration that's common between your various services. And it's nice to have those in one central place as opposed to copy and paste it in individual properties files within each application. But even if it's unique configuration, having it in an application of properties or application.yaml that's bound up in your application, it now has to evolve at the same pace as the application itself. So if you want to make a change to nothing but the configuration, now you have to build the whole application again. By putting it in the config server, it's external. 
More, moreover, you can also track it. You can trace, you can track who's made changes, when it was changed, you can roll it back, things like that. And one, one of the real benefits of this is imagine if you have a thousand applications running that all need similar configuration, you don't want to have to go and configure each of those individually. Yes. yes. Correct. Uh, you can use whichever ones you want to use. Yes. Yeah, you don't have to use them all. They, when you go to provision, you provision one at a time, so you can pick what you want and, dis and disregard them. That's yeah. right. Correct. That's right. I'm sorry. The question is, can you do all of this in PCF Dev? Is that that's the question? Um, Not currently. Uh, Scott Fredericks is also on our team, and he's sitting up here in the front row. So what, what were you saying? <laughs> okay, so the answer Scott has given is that the uh, version that they just released, a PCF dev, does work. Oh, I didn't even know that. That's cool. <laughs> now I've got to go try that. <laughs> right. Scott, do you remember the, the version number on that? No, it's, it just got released like a week ago, so it's really new. Okay. Uh, the answer is we don't know what the version is, but it was last it's week. New. <laughs> it's new. <laughs> Go find the latest one. That's yeah. it. Is it the entire SCS that's available for PCF? Yeah. Scott says yes. Uh, Craig, Craig and I were yeah, not involved with PCF dev. That's news to we're me. We're glad that Scott is here to answer Zero these nine. questions. <laughs> Sorry? Ben sort of mumbled something like 0 0.8. Oh. It's 0 0.8. Or okay. 0 0.18. 18. 0 0.18. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ben. All right. I paused this, and I also screwed up when I paused it, so I had to go back while everybody was talking and get caught back up. So let's unpause it and keep on going here. Now that I have all those, those provisioned, I'm going to go check on their status by saying CF services. You can see they're all still creating progress. Now, if this had been a live, actual live demo, this would have been a good thing to do while answering questions, but... Um, I, I, I cut the time a little bit. I, I went ahead and did it. I cut the video so we wouldn't have to wait on it. And here, momentarily, I'm going to go ahead and do a CF services again. And suddenly, it's like one of those things where they do the baking thing on the news. Then um, suddenly, the cake's ready, right? Um, well, I, here it is. The cake's ready. The create succeeded. Our services are provisioned. So now let's actually bind those services. And so helps if I hit the right button. There we go. So we have, I'm going to go ahead and do a CF, assuming I ended up on the right slide. Yes, I did. CF apps. I already have previously, before I got to this point, I've gone ahead and done a CF push of the Fortune service and the Fortune UI. At this point, they're not bound to anything. They're just kind of hanging out there waiting for me to, to do this step. So I'm going to bind the Fortune service to the config server. I'm going to uh, bind the uh, Fortune service to the service registry. I don't need to bind it to Circuit Breaker, but I will do that for the uh, Fortune UI. So as you can see, this is terribly interesting. It's basically using CF bind service, giving it the app name, giving it the service. I'll kind of, in the interest of time, kind of zoom through some of this. And then I had to, oh, I forgot this little step here. I had to set CF target. Now, the reason I had to set CF target is because uh, we're using uh, self-signed certificates in this case, and I essentially needed to tell the, tell the environment to don't worry about the fact that I'm using a self-signed certificate if the certificate is coming from Blue, which is the environment I, I have this running on. So telling it if the, if this comes from, if the certificate is coming from Blue, don't worry about the fact. Don't, don't complain. Don't, don't barf all over it. It's going to be just fine. That's, it's an unfortunate little thing we have to do but uh, when you're using self-signed certificates, but it, it's a little minor step we have to do. And then I have to restage. Now, be thankful I cut the video at this point. This is the part where restage and we could talk about all sorts of other stuff and I would run out of time before we got to see anything else because restage takes a moment or two. It basically makes, it, it, essentially it makes sure that those, those properties I just set, make sure that the bindings I just set get applied to the application and the application can see them. Thanks to the uh, miracle of video editing, it happened really quickly. And then I'm going to go through the same steps, essentially, for the 
uh, Fortune UI. The only big difference worth noting here is that I also bound it to the circuit breaker dashboard. Really, that other than that, not much different here. And I'm going to do a restage. It's going to be fine. And then I'm just going to do a last thing I'm going to do before I move on to the next step is I'm going to do a CF services. And at this point, I can see, in fact, that my, con my config server has Fortune Service and Fortune UI bound to it. I can see the same thing for service registry. Circuit Breaker Dashboard has Fortune UI bound to it. All right, so now I'm ready to show you a little bit more about the application itself uh, with the application running. And so I'm, I'm basically I couldn't remember readily what the uh, UI should, URI should be. So this is me poking about just to steal a URI from the um, PCF screens. And I, then I go tweak it to put in random. So I'm, at this point, I'm hitting the fortune service random endpoint. And I'm going to hit it a few times. You can see each time I do, I get a different, uh, a different fortune. It's, it's probably a little hard to see because it's small there. But it's really, it's not important to read what the fortunes are. It's just note that I'm getting a different fortune each time. Now, the UI kind of is the same thing. The UI is going to turn around and hit uh, Eureka. It's going to ask it for the location of the fortune service, and it's going to hit that and pick random services and or random fortunes and show them in the UI. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, let's go see what this looks like in Service Registry. Service Registry itself, uh, Roy had shown you from the OSS point of view a Eureka dashboard earlier. We have the same thing here. eventually. Uh, we have the same thing here where, let's see if I can help it along a little bit. Where you can see we have, we have the service registry dashboard, which uh, looks remarkably like the Eureka dashboard in many ways, except it's styled differently. But you can see that we have both the Fortune service and the Fortune UI, uh, or, or simply the UI service registered in Eureka. In addition to that, we also have the circuit breaker dashboard. Go in there, we go hit manage, and we're going to see the circuit breaker dashboard showing our single random fortune circuit breaker, which is not very exciting right now because we don't have a lot of traffic to it. So for the next few frames, I'm going to just sit there and beat up on the, um, the fortune UI. I'm going to just hit refresh in the browser. I could probably use curl or something like that to make it more dramatic, but just hitting refresh in the browser is enough to actually create some activity on the circuit breaker. You can see that the, uh, the line graph went up a little bit higher. We do it a little bit more. We're going to see some additional traffic on the circuit breaker dashboard. And you can see that the line graph went up a little bit higher. And now let's do something really cool, and let's go kill the fortune service. We're going to stop it. So now we don't have a fortune service anymore. We, we, it's gone. We killed it. We only had one instance. And I'm going to uh, try this once more. Now we're getting, no, we're not getting fortunes, we're getting your future is unclear, which is the default fortune. <laughs> and you can see that the circle, little bubble turned red, meaning it's failing. You can see that we got some failed um, requests. We have two of them going on right there. And basically, I can, I'm going to zoom through this because we only got about five minutes left. I'm going to zoom through this a little bit. And you can see that eventually I'm, I'm going to restart it. And you're going to get future is unclear, future is unclear, and then suddenly at some point, it's going to start working. Now we started getting uh, some new fortunes. We go back to the circuit breaker. We can see now it's happy again. All right. The only other thing I haven't shown you uh, with regard to dashboards, I've shown you circuit breaker dashboard. I've shown you service registry dashboard. But what about config server dashboard? It's a lot less interesting. A lot less interesting. Uh, in fact, how, just see how boring it is. Um, it's going to simply show you those properties you set when you created the config server. In a previous version of SCS, we did have a dashboard where you could go set those properties. Uh, it was removed uh, largely because it didn't make sense. Uh, we, uh, it was really hard to, it was this weird thing we had to go create an instance of the config server and then go into the UI to set it up before you could even start using it. Now, we, we just go ahead and encourage you to set those properties at the command line when you could provision the service. And, but we will echo them out to you here. And then finally, just, it's going to have to go through really quickly, but uh, how do we get, dig, dig into these? How does, if I'm acting as the client, if, I, if I'm the fortune service, or if I'm the 
Fortune UI, how do I use the config server? So I'm going to pretend to be that service for now, for the sake of this, this slide. And we're going to go dig into the Fortune service, and, and we're going to specifically dig into the Fortune service's config server binding credentials. And everything we need to know about binding is right here. We have the access token URI, where, where we're going to go to get an access token. We have the client ID, we have the client secret, the credentials for this application to get a token. And we also have the URI for the service itself. Now, if I, I'm going to show you in a second, if we try to hit that URI as is, you're going to get a 401, un unauthorized bag. Or un it's just not going to work. And what I'm going to do is copy that, that token URI, and I'm going to use this tool called UAAC to basically target the uh, target that that application's binding URL or its token URL. I'm going to from there. I'm going to ask it to get a client token, and to do that, I need the to the client or the application's credentials. So I'm going to need its client ID, cut and paste. I'm also going to need its secret, paste that in there. And now the last thing I have to do is just ask UAAC to give me the context, which when it does that gives me, among other things, an access token. So if I were to try to, again, hit that uh, URL, that binding URI there at the very last property, if I try to hit that directly, yeah, unauthorized. You're not allowed to do this. You need full authentication. You didn't give me an access token, essentially. Or even if I did give it an access token, it's possible I could give it a bad access token. Regardless, I'm not allowed to do this on its own. If I'm, if I'm some random application that got deployed out there and they somehow managed to find the URI for the config server, it doesn't matter unless they also have the credentials to get an access token with. But when I do try this with an access token, I make the same request, essentially, but I also say set the authorization a, a header to a bearer token where the bearer token is copy and pasted from this up here. And then now, whoops, I hate it when I do that. Let's see if I can zoom back to where I was at. And now you can see that you see it's a little hard to read because of the formatting, but you can see I got the configuration details from the config server. And just like if I were the actual application itself, I can now use these as, the, uh, as part of the environment abstraction. And now it's one of, my, one of the properties uh, in, in one of my property sources. And that's it. All right. So as you can see, we really wanted to compare Spring Cloud OSS, the same functionality that we offer on Spring Cloud services and the advantages that we provide being the security and the, the advantages of the platform and keeping everything up and, and available to your applications. And uh, thank you guys for coming. Are there yeah, any thanks. questions?